right, if you'd please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation led by Pastor Drew Reddy. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to be called your children. We pray this morning that you would fill this space with your presence, that we would know that you are present here, that you would be filling us with wisdom and grace and mercy. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our commissioners. We pray that they would just be guided by you in all the decisions that they make. We pray for our community. We pray that uh, as uh, COVID continues to move uh, throughout our community, Lord God, that you would keep people safe, that you would continue to help us to know what uh, the best response is. We pray that this would be a community of peace, uh, a community that would demonstrate love and equality. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just revive us, direct us, guide us, pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Do we have any correspondence or organizational business today? No, sir. All right. Do we have any public comment? All right. Uh, the citizen desiring to speak on the item not on the agenda may do so at this time. Discussion is limited to five minutes and the commission will not take action or discuss items at this time. Discussion should be limited to matters of county commission business and public comment is not permitted in regards to personnel matter or on pending legal matters. Items introduced under public comment may become agenda items at a later date. Brian Webster. Good morning, county commissioners. Brian Webster, 1108 Osborne Road. The reason for my meeting today to object to the accuracy of the public comments recorded on public record for June 10th. Thank you. All right. Our consent agenda today would be consider and approve Franklin County Commission meeting minutes for June 17th. Consider and approve soliciting bids to replenish our stock of tires for the Public Works Department and to consider approving allowing free dumping at the transfer station for all of the community fairs in Franklin County. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as stated? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Saldemeyer? Yes. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Chair Waymeyer. Yes. All right. On the items of business, the first of which would be to consider for approval implementing the cost of living adjustment for the county, all county employees. This is the cost of living adjustment we budget for every year. Go ahead. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I'm Sari Maple, in case any of you aren't sure who I am or know how to pronounce my name, <laughs> which I know is strange. Um, the first item of business I'd like to propose is the uh, cost of living, the 1% cost of living adjustment for county employees. And this would be effective pay period beginning June 21st, 2020. And um, the cost of living adjustment was budgeted for the current fiscal year and staff has determined that revenues are within appropriate range for the COLA to be implemented. Good news. This is something that, you know, a couple of months ago, I had considerable doubt about. Um, kind of at the beginning of the COVID event, we were all worried about what revenues were going to look like. We thought it would impact cities more than counties, and indeed it has. Uh, but with all of the talk about pushing the property tax deadline back, and it just it was an uncertainty, but. Janet has looked into this for us and we are right within a similar range that we always are. And so this has been budgeted and, and in terms of me recommending it, it's really a no brainer at this point. So I'll just, I'll just let you guys know that I did um, 
take the same time frame from January to June last year and this year, and we were e actually ever so slightly higher on tax revenue. Like we were right at 97% collected last year at this time, and we were like 97.3 this year collected. So slightly higher, and I know sales tax has been a huge concern. Um, we budgeted $1.9 million in sales tax, and we've collected roughly $950,000 in sales tax to this point. So we would expect to collect half of our sales tax by now, and we have done that. So everything looks like it should look at this time of year. That would be just in the fifth month of the year, wouldn't it? You wouldn't have June's numbers yet on sales tax? I would have to go back and check that. Um, it, they come at different times, sure. so. Okay. Uh, the only, the only thing I really have any concern about is transient guest tax with our activities that we usually plan in September to be lower, but that um, would have very minimal impact on, yeah. on this, so. All right, well, any more questions for Sari? Would somebody like to make a motion to approve the 1% cost of living adjustment for county employees effective the pay period beginning June 21 of 2020? Like that most to approve. All right. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Absolutely. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Stottlemyer? Yes. Chair Waitmeyer? Yes. All right. Our second item of business is to add an administrative coordinator position to the Franklin County pay plan in grade 17. But this is really reclassified, not add. We wouldn't be adding any positions would we right um, just some background as a result of COVID-19 and really the stay-at-home order that was in place there were county positions that were affected um, some experienced a reorganization of duties we did have a reduction in force and as county offices have now resumed day-to-day -day, um, operations were fully reopened we took some time to review the existing executive administrative assistant position and tried, well, really uh, revamped that position to include some additional responsibilities that uh, would also not only include supporting the administration department and the commissioners, but also adding support for human resources, kind of a backup person, and then also for the um, Franklin County Development Council. So you're correct, it's uh, really not a new position, but it's a new title, and it will replace the executive administrative assistant position that's currently budgeted at a grade 17, and it will be called administrative coordinator. So the grade is the same? As yes. Mm -hmm. right. That's what uh, this is a completely budget neutral move. Um, some of you are aware of this, but um, we had this discussion. So back before I hired my previous assistant, we had a long discussion about what it was that I needed, um, whether I needed an executive administrative assistant or a secretary. I mean, truth be told, I need a secretary. I need someone to open my mail. I need someone to answer my phone calls. I don't need an executive level assistant. I don't use one particularly well. Like there's not a lot of fluff in my day. Like when things reach my desk, um, they get my attention. So I can't delegate that sort of work to someone. And so I've had two assistants now, and I, I don't feel like I did a great job of utilizing either of them, and I take responsibility for that. And so over you know the last several months, as you know, we've had discussions with FCDC about um, utilizing county office space. Paul Bean actually had a hand in drafting this job description so that it could include some FCDC duties. This position will now report directly to Sari. She will still, he or she will still offer services on behalf of the board, on behalf of myself, 
but SARI will be the direct report, and, and that is so that there can always be direct oversight, because among the things that I didn't do incredibly well was provide a lot of direct oversight to this position. And so um, we crafted a position that we thought would add the most value to the organization, and talking with Paul and talking with SARI, I now think we're gonna get a lot of value out of it. We just need to tweak it a little bit, but it is the exact same grade, exact same money as the previous position. So it's a completely neutral budget move. Will this be considered a full-time position? Oh yeah. So what are we gonna do on the tourism director part? Well, that's a completely, this isn't, this has well, nothing to will we be still taking six tenths of the funding from tourism to pay for this position or well, where no. will I go? You're you're thinking of the tourism coordinator position. That's an entirely different position. So the two positions that were affected from COVID were the executive administrative assistant and then the tourism coordinator. This has nothing to do with tourism. None of this salary will be paid for with TGT funds. Okay, well, that's why, I see, the budget says six tenths communications director included. And I'm just trying to get that straight in my mind, what, what we're doing there. So in the tourism budget is a tourism coordinator and part of the communications position. You need to flip over to the administration budget. That's where this position will be budgeted. So um, this was um, previously officed in the administration department, f wholly funded by the administration department and budgeted that way as Derek's executive administrative assistant. So this has nothing to do with the tourism budget. This is just administration. So that, will this go away then, this line item in we're, tourism? We're not talking about anything in the tourism budget. We're, we're in the administration budget. Okay. So that that person is, is still not returned to, to regular, yeah, that, regular duty. You're looking at a separate position. That is the tourism coordinator position. What's well, the communications director? Well, the communications director and the tourism coordinator, those are our two tourism positions. This move and this item in front of you has has nothing to do with either of those the, this this so, one never has been paid for out of out of uh, tourism yeah. dollars this well, i thought we started when we first started we said we were but that was communication no that was That's casey's position about. this is my executive assistant okay so well, i just i'm just trying to get it clear in my head mm -hmm. because there is funds dedicated to communication director in the tourism budget right yeah, and that's, that's a different person that's and that's casey about. oh but this position we're talking about is a full-time position it is my assistant position oh, we are they just... won't have anything to do with tourism right oh, that is okay. correct well, that's all i wanted to know yeah yeah okay i'm catching up now okay no no problem all right any other questions on this uh administrative coordinator position the motion a motion in the affirmative would be to approve adding administrative coordinator to the Franklin County pay plan in grade 17. Is there a motion to that effect? Motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Saldemeyer? Yes. Commissioner Howard? Yes. Chair Waymeyer. Yes. I did want to make one comment. Sari, I do know who you are. I know how to say your name, <laughs> and I do appreciate your work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sari came on in an odd time with uh, COVID and everything, and I guess we it's true we haven't uh, seen her or been around her as much as maybe it would normally. Yeah. yeah, we definitely know who you are, Sari. So that brings us to staff reports. Derek? Okay, I have gotten several questions about the tax sale recently. Um, 
we, the tax sale has been filed. It is currently in the district court. So uh, in order to have a tax sale, you first have to file a lawsuit. That lawsuit has been filed. Where we are at currently is the defendants, and the defendants are the owners of the properties who haven't paid their taxes. They are currently, uh, we are waiting on the answer deadline for those defendants to expire. So we have filed what's called a petition in court. We filed a lawsuit. Now we're waiting on that answer period that they have to respond to expire. Once that expires, assuming that no affirmative defenses are submitted, and it's rare for one of these defendants to file an answer, normally they just, they're not paying their taxes and it's a pretty, pretty simple lawsuit in that regard. Once that expires, we will petition the court to order the tax sale. I cannot tell you when that's going to be because I am completely at the mercy of the judge on that and the court's docket. It's more complicated than ever because of the backlog that was created by COVID-19. And so, but it is in the court system. It is moving. It's something that I've had correspondence with our counsel on. We know actions being taken on it. So I will provide updates to the board as I receive them. Uh, you've received correspondence from me on these federal relief funds that we are uh, in line to receive. I've called them SPARC funds. Um, SPARC is the committee that the state has put together in order to help administer. We haven't received the funds yet. We believe it's imminent. Um, I will tell you I am growing frustrated with the process because we aren't getting a ton of guidance. Um, the listserv that I'm on with county administrators is blowing up because there's, there's complications with it. If you look at the, the funds come from a federal relief package. The federal relief package makes it pretty clear that these funds are to flow to local governments without restriction. Well, the state of Kansas is requiring that you all execute a resolution that places a lot of restrictions on these funds, uh, mandates a pretty aggressive timeline for spending these funds, and doesn't give us much in the way of what is allowed and what is not. This is troubling to me because we're also getting instruction that we need to share these funds with other local government entities, cities, school districts, which is fine, but all of the exposure lies on us. I mean, whatever we can give, say, the city of Ottawa funding, but if they don't use it for an allowable purpose, then, then that exposure is going to lie on the Board of County Commissioners, and that in and of itself is troubling. And so... One of the things that we're going to do, um, we're going to put an advisory committee together, and that advisory committee, led by me, will be in front of all of you making recommendations on what it is that, how we allocate these funds. But I, I'm going to say it publicly now. It'll be the first thing out of my mouth at the committee meeting. If I'm not comfortable with the legality of what someone wants to do with these funds, I will not recommend it. I will die on that hill. Um, I'm already getting requests from entities that they, people are seeing this as a cash grab, and that is not what this is. Um, and I know it's going to get political, and there are going to be a lot of, of entities that are going to get told no. There are going to be a lot of ideas that are going to get told no. That's not because I personally want to say no to them. It is because at the end of the day, when there is an audit, and we've been told to expect an audit, like the use of those funds is going to be assessed. And as I've said, if it's deemed that it's not legal, it will be Franklin County that is on the hook for that. And those, of course, will be funds that we haven't budgeted. And so I just, I'm, I'm going to be fairly stubborn in terms of what recommendations come before you. And if any of you feel different about that, if you would like me to take a different approach, let me know. 
Um, certainly you can bet we will be creative um, and we will push the limits of what I think can safely be considered a legal use, but that threshold is not one that I am comfortable crossing. That's really disappointing because on the news, no, not you, but the mayor of Kansas City, which would be on the Missouri side, was saying what about some funds, and I'm assuming it's pretty much the same kind of funds, what they're going to use, and he's saying that he has it doesn't have to be spent all at once and he can use it to help uh, you know some of his communities that have yeah that need help you know and and so that's that's really disappointing that we're getting so many restrictions on it well and it appears as of now that uh, I think the most troubling thing is the timeline for spending is really aggressive and and that's just hard to do because Obviously, we haven't realized all of our expenses yet in terms of allotment for prospective expenses. It's a little murky on whether or not we can do that. Like the whole thing needs, we need more guidance and instruction. I, I hope I'm back here in a week. Um, and I hope at that time that I have more instruction and that this isn't as convoluted as it currently seems. But as of this moment in time, it, it's kind of a mess. So, um, but I will continue to update you on that. Um, COVID, obviously, um, I spoke with each of you. We made the decision to stay in phase three. Um, we made that decision because we have seen an uptick in our cases. I've got Nick here. Um, Nick's going to be up in Wellsville tomorrow. Wellsville in particular has been a hot spot. And, and what I would emphasize is we've seen an uptick while simultaneously um, we're seeing more people refuse to be tested, which is really hampering our ability to do contact tracing. And so obviously I don't know this, but you know, with more tests, more contact tracing, you would presumably see even more positives. And so even with less cooperation that we're seeing, our numbers are currently still, and so I know I it's something we're taking very seriously it's something we talk about multiple times every single day um, I know Nick and Dr. Bud are basically joined at the hip on this so um, any questions for me uh, certainly feel free to ask I would have Nick come up and kind of give you a more thorough update on that well uh, Nick's on the way what sort of funds what sort of number amount of dollars on these funds well we haven't received anything yet but the the number that we've been tentatively given is like 5.2 million dollars and with the restrictions that i am seeing i, I and the timeline like <laughs> i'm a pretty creative guy but there's no conceivable way that we can spend anywhere near that based on the restrictions that were my cynical belief, and this is cynical, is that uh, the resolution that you're being asked to sign basically states if you don't spend it by this time, it goes back to the state of Kansas, which is what they want, in my opinion. And so, um, but it is, a, it is a chunk of money, and I hope I'm wrong about that. That's speculation, but I... Do you need to talk about the committee yet, or are you not ready about maybe putting that together starting to ask folks and yeah and I have um, I obviously this is something Janet will be on that committee Nick will be on that committee uh, Richard Neinstadt the Ottawa City Manager will be on that committee Paul Bean will be on that committee um, you know we'll get some representation from the other cities as well like the challenge is not making it too big um, but yes, we, I would want a representative from the Board of Commissioners to sit on it at that level. Just, you know, all of this is going to come back in front of you, but I think having someone uh, sit on the uh, advisory committee as well to see the whole process and the discussion would be beneficial. So um, 
I have not formally reached out to anyone but Paul and Richard, but yeah, we're, we're already in the process of putting that together. Have a meeting with Paul tomorrow to sit down and really start fleshing some of this out, so. Do we need to talk about that here, about who'd potentially be on that board so we could get it on somebody's calendar? Yeah, I, I come think. Up last minute? Yeah, I mean, I. I think one of you would, I think it would be ideal just so, I mean, like to thank as staff, we always do a good job of, of giving you all of the details of the discussion, but something that has the potential to be as political as this, I would just like one of you to sit on that committee. And so. Uh, Which would all come back to us ultimately be our decision anyway. Ever, so, yeah. All of it would, yeah. I'd be willing to do it. I don't know if anybody else is interested. I think as a chair, it, it's really up to you. It, it, I mean, I would do it, but but you, I think, would should have the authority to do that, definitely. It should be you. I'm, I'm for you doing it, Cole. Yeah. Okay, all right. I'd, like I say, I'll just do my best. We'll, it'll all come back to you guys anyways, so it'll be your decision, but I'll do my best to uh, bring back the rationale and communicate why why the recommendation got to you so all right anything else no, i i will just emphasize the the committee is advisory like they will not make a decision on how to spend a single cent of that money um that will all come back and be the board of commissioners decision and you bet we will you know we'll have a thorough breakdown of the discussion and the rationale just as we always do so and that's all I have. All right. Hey, Nick, what can you tell us? Good morning. <clears throat> As of 8.30 this morning, we have uh, received results back on 1,984 tests. We have 66 positives. Right now, we have 21 active positives throughout the county. Um, we've tested uh, the, on Monday, and up to now, we've tested right out 150 people this week. We, uh, as Derek said, are starting to run into some roadblocks, which other communities have seen it too. Once you get a certain amount of positive cases and when you have an influx like we have had, you start running into difficulties on contact tracing. And that pretty much is when you're in the community spread, you can't figure out where it came from, that kind of thing. So we've received quite a bit of phone calls from our Wellsville community because of the increase in that area. Um, we've got worked with KDHE to secure a certain amount of tests to allow us to do contact tracing on individuals who feel they have been in contact with a positive. Due to rules, laws, HIPAA, we can't go out and say these are the five, six, 12 people that have been in the community, have you been close to them? But a lot of people have speculation, social media, um, has caused people to uh, feel they've been in contact with individuals. So working with KDHE, we will be setting up at the Wellsville High School tomorrow. Uh, we've worked closely with Ryan up there at the high school. We had a conference call with the mayor, with the city clerk, the police uh, chief or his representative to um, outline this to make sure we have a smooth process. But if somebody in the Wellsville area or somebody that has a kid in the Wellsville school that doesn't live in the area or, and feel that they've been in contact with the positive or welcome to come through tomorrow. We'll have a questionnaire to get information on who they feel they were around that was positive. So if they were around positive cases, we can reach back out to them and use that for our contact tracing. But that will happen tomorrow from 830 to 4. Um, one of the big things that we've been working on this week is nursing facility reopening. Uh, that is a hot topic across the state. Uh, if you saw the Kansas City Star yesterday, there was 11 deaths from a nursing home that got uh, in that facility earlier last or later last week, and now they're having an influx run through that nursing facility. Our nursing homes, um, assisted living facilities, retirement communities have done a great job keeping it out. And I can't stress that enough with the job they have done. But mental health of the residents with uh, 
a big push to open, a big push to see the loved ones. They're starting to get a lot of pressure to reopen. So we've worked with them. I have all the reopening plans. Uh, Dr. Ransom, myself, Aaron, Robert, Jennifer have uh, been in contact with them. We've had two conference calls now with, so I, uh, I know as long as they're in phase three, they're gonna be in a holding pattern on what they're going to do, but they all have very solid reopening plans and I'm uh, hopeful that we can continue to keep this out, the COVID out of them. Um, with that, that's what our big uh, agenda has been is contact tracing since we have had the, the increase in cases, we're spending quite a bit of time tracking people down and, and getting testing done. So we have been successful. Uh, we did go through a Ottawa Family Physicians, Ottawa Family Physicians Lab, which I will tell you have been a great partner throughout this. They were able to secure us 900 swabs that uh, meet the needs. So that has been one of the things we've struggled with throughout, but I just found out as I was walking over here today, we did get 900 with the option ordering another 900. So um, that, that's very good news with, with what's going on. So with that, I'm open for questions. Derek say that you had some people that refused to get tested? Can they there do that? There are individuals that uh, may be close contacts that have just decided that they'll take a 14 day quarantine and not be tested. And what we've learned as we've went through this process is a lot of people don't want to be swabbed. They, they uh, are either scared of it, don't want it, are afraid of it, whatever. But uh, we're, we're seeing more and more people who do not want to be tested because of the process in which the testing is. Well, I thought that maybe they didn't want to be tested because they didn't want to be quarantined, but if they're still, you know, accepting the quarantine, I guess. The mass majority of them have accepted the quarantine or doing what they need to do. One of the things we have seen is communities around us that do testing are not issuing the quarantine orders, not giving the guidance and the education. So when people come into our community, they're not following the quarantine orders. They're not um, upholding the stuff that we're putting out. And it's, it's such a vast difference. You look at Osage County versus Johnson County and three employees in the Osage County um, Health Department with the vast majority of, uh, of how many they have in Johnson County and able to do their own <laughs> testing in their own lab. There's a lot of differences on either side of us on what's going on with COVID. I really hadn't paid a lot of attention. I look at the county numbers every now and then and I see some counties like Chase County with, they were at one for a long time and now they're at three or four and some other counties, I'm like, well, those counties are doing pretty well. But then when I got the list of the, the funds we were talking about just a second ago, and it was showing what each county was gonna get by population, and I started looking at the populations on, and how much each county is getting, and it's like, oh my, Chase County only got 1,200 people. <laughs> so, you know, you start seeing all those good numbers, and if you look close at their population, their counties, so, a lot of them are under 2,000 for the whole county, so that's maybe why their numbers are so good. But And, and the other thing that, that tags on to that, what we've learned is a lot of health departments are still following their hours that they had prior to COVID. So if they're closed on Fridays, they're closed on Friday. So if test results come back on a Friday, Saturday, or so, they're not calling people and telling them whether they're negative or positive. They're waiting till Monday to do that. So. And, and they don't have the resources. One of the things with the KDHE, when we talked to them about doing this Wellsville drive-through, they wanted to know what resources we needed and they were pleasantly surprised. The only thing we needed was them to do our lab. They, we didn't need people to come down here and they're short staffed and they think it'll be two or three weeks before we can help you. And I said, we don't need anything but you to process our tests. And that's why we got it pushed through. But, um, you know, we, my staff on, the, on Saturday was up Till, 10, till 9.30 at night, Saturday night, finishing a follow-up on a positive case. So with that, we're working a lot of hours to keep our, our public informed, to be responsive to our citizens, where a lot of your smaller health departments are not even returning phone calls on weekends. So something to I don't have as much problem with the ones refusing to, to test if they're still quarantined themselves for 14 days ones i would have a problem with is the ones that refuse to test and refuse to quarantine too so one of the false negatives a few of those 
one of the false uh, thoughts that we've been dealing a lot with is if you are a close contact to a positive and you test negative, we're trying to test somewhere in the five to six day following contact. That get, what we feel is gonna give us a higher percentage of finding out if, if they do have COVID or if it's starting to become uh, active in the body. Even if you're tested at six days and you are a close contact, you still have a chance of developing that on day 10. So there's the close contacts still have a 14 day quarantine whether they're tested or not. The testing really helps us be able to go track down more contacts than wait till the 14 days or they start having symptoms and then now they could have been out in the public and spreading it. So that's kind of the rationale behind why we're doing it. Something that uh, I want to put out there, like what disappoints me is uh, Dr. Ransom and I had this conversation the other day. I, was, I went in a business over the weekend. There was, I won't name the business, but there was three employees and I think there was maybe six people in there that, besides myself and uh, I was the only one that had a mask on. Just aren't, aren't doing it. And that's disappointing because if, like I said, if our cases are going up, one up everywhere. It's like. And that truly is, I've said that to so many of our cases that, you know, don't want to quarantine or upset about it. I'm like, if you, if you wear a mask and you do proper hand washing, you're going to almost eliminate the chance of spreading this disease. We've seen it over and over again with positive cases that are wearing masks that haven't spread it, even to their local household people. And it's just they've got to take care and protect each other. And wearing a mask and washing your hands are the most important thing we can do. How many people have we tested total? Right now, as far as results we've got back are 1,984. So oh, somewhere at about 50. Seven, eight percent of the county. Yeah. What, how's that compared to other counties? I've got to imagine that's high, that we're doing well as far as getting a good, good sample. If, if on our testing and what we're sending in, we're above a lot of the communities around us and the amount of testing that we're doing. A lot of uh, communities are still saying that they're not doing the contact testing. They're saying if there's a household positive, they presume a positive and they quarantine and we're telling them to stay home. Uh, you look just around where we're at, uh, Johnson County is still doing testing, Douglas County is still doing testing, but uh, other places are kind of opening up to the fully capacity. Uh, Anderson County, you look down there, they're open completely up and without doing the amount of testing that they're not doing, that, that's happening here, down there, what's the numbers look like? So that's the concerns. I know you gave the total when you started, but what exactly were we up from Casey's report on uh, Monday? I think we were up eight, weren't we, Casey, or something on Monday over the weekend? We're up since, since Friday, we're at nine cases. So we're just up one from the yes. last? Yeah, and that came in because we didn't test anybody over the weekend. On Monday, we hit the test, and that's where we uh, got this one from. And we'll see those results start trickling in. That one came in late last night. We'll start seeing results come in from that testing today, and then we'll. And then we'll, we'll have the Wellsville test. And that's yeah, we'll tomorrow. Have, yes. Yeah. When we when do you expect to get those results back? By Friday. We're talking to uh, KDHE. They have reserved us a spot for a certain amount of tests, and we'll send two batches up on, on uh, tomorrow, and hopefully by Friday afternoon, Friday evening, we'll start getting results back. Well, Nick, uh, Monday looked like a madhouse around here. Uh, I, I pulled in, and a deputy sheriff stopped me, and I asked, what's going on? Is it some kind of emergency here at, at the <laughs> annex? And he said, then he told me about Wellsville spike. And there must have been like at least 50 to 100 cars zigzagging around the parking lot out front. And he said, it's just kind of crazy today. Well, and, uh, I, and jump in, Nick. My understanding of what happened there was we did a lot of contact tracing and told a lot of folks or recommended that a lot of folks come in for testing. and. Whereas we would normally schedule those tests in blocks so that, you know, said percentage would be there at 8.30, 9.30, and so on. 
we failed to do that. And so what happened was everybody just was there first thing and that led to just it got bogged down and we needed to call the sheriff and and so moving forward we'll and we have done that. We just for whatever reason that didn't happen on Monday, but we will emphasize to staff that they need to schedule in blocks so that we don't have that exact issue because you're right it was a madhouse down here you're moving to wellsville and you have good systems. we have it so and we learned a lot monday i uh i pulled in monday and we told people 8 30 and there was already people lining up at eight and we've done this you know for months now and we've had some larger businesses that we've done mass testing and when we say 8 30 to 10 they trickle through this was one of those where i think everybody wanted to get it done and we, we organized the chaos quickly, but I will tell you if we have another issue like this, we'll either do it offsite somewhere like where we have a larger area or as Derek said, like we've done in the past, we'll do blocks and if it's certain amounts of people here and there, but yeah, it ended up uh, to be quite well. We uh, tested 134 people from 8.30 to 11.30, which that the most we had done in the past was 80 in a day. So we, got hammered, the OFP staff stepped up. Um, we had actually administrative people from OFP helping us do it. So a good team effort, we knocked it out, but in the future we learned a lot from that one. Well, and, and one of the things that I will tell you is gonna be in front of you uh, coming full circle and getting back to those spark funds. We're gonna make sure that we have the staff that we need for a potential influx in the fall. Um, it is clear that uh, two of the requirements are that it, it needs to be related to COVID and the funds can't have already been budgeted. So much to my dismay, for example, I can't pay Nick's salary from March through December with these funds because those are funds that have already been budgeted but all over time that has been worked by health department staff that will be eligible for reimbursement our treasurer's office are going to be working some overtime to get caught up on the backlog of of you know motor vehicle stuff that will be reimbursed i am going to encourage nick to get more contact tracers on staff for a potential push in the fall because i believe very strongly that that is an allowable expense with these funds and so we will make sure that our health department has all of the resources needed um, for whatever happens in the fall and we just hope that we won't end up needing all of it, but certainly um, that's what the funds are supposed to be for. We're gonna make sure we we have what we need. So. One of the biggest fears we have moving forward, if, depending on what happens with schools, July is going to start back to school shots. We're gonna have to figure out how to handle the amount of people that we've already done. That we normally do vaccines on in an appointment situation or a social distancing situation. So it's, there's a lot of things coming down the pipe within the next couple months. Flu shots, they're encouraging flu shots now closer to August, which we really hope they don't miss the mark and they can get close to what the actual flu strain is gonna be or we could have an influx of COVID and flu symptoms. So it's a, a lot coming up. I hope I these uh, I don't know the vaccinations question. that's going to phase three testing pan out three I saw that this morning that's going to phase three so I we use one on work <laughs> so any other questions well, there's a nasal swab my wife had to get it done to get the outpatient surgery there at, at Advent and she said it felt like a lobotomy uh, <laughs> procedure how far up the nose passage do you have to go it, it has to go all the way to the back of the throat through the nose so it's it I've had it done. It you can feel it tickling the back of your brain when you do it. It's and it has to be in one nerve for 15 seconds, and then it goes in the other nerve for 15 seconds. So you get it in both sides for it, it's it's unpleasant. But yeah, it goes all the way back to the nasal pharynx. 
They had the refusal rate just went up. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly what just happened. But, yeah. Like I said, it's, it's it's not horrible. If you've had a flu, if you've had the flu swab, it's the same thing as the flu swab. So, any other questions I can answer? Thank you very much. See you. Uh, I'll have Nick tell you about the bone drill they have there at the EMS and uh, how that works and the, the nasal swab won't seem so bad at all, right? <laughs> Sheriff? Nothing? Casey? A couple of quick things. Um, we did put out a chart yesterday by city because that's been requested several times. Um, number of cases by city. So that's on our social media and our website if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and then I know that Derek's in no hurry to open up the travel center. I'm not as well, but I have um, remained in contact with the hospital because um, they have so many volunteers. A lot of them are the same volunteers just to kind of know what their thoughts are on the entire thing. Um, and they make up a lot of FTEs for the hospital. Um, and they don't even want to start discussing it until we start move, until we move into the phase out period. So that's just a quick update on that. Other than that, just answering lots of questions and doing the COVID thing. Any questions for me? Okay. Thanks. David? Okay, since uh, last week we've replaced or repaired uh, five crossroad tubes, we also made a uh, temporary repair on the railroad, uh, at the, on the railroad crossing on Colorado, south of Pomona. Uh, those tubes are in pretty bad shape and we've requested the railroad uh, get those replaced. Um, uh, we haven't had a whole lot of luck with that to date, but we did, um, we did get permission to go in and, and kind of uh, solidify the bottom of those tubes with uh, some of our own material that we had available. So uh, if it does, if we do experience a flood again, hopefully um, those temporary repairs will allow the water to, uh, to get through those pipes like it's designed to do. Um, we've also, uh, we also finished some work on Ellis Road. Uh, we did a bunch of ditch work between Idaho and Delaware. Uh, we finished that project up by adding rock to the surface. Uh, we've done several ditching jobs, one in Wheatland Farms, um, uh, and we started one on Labette between Louisiana and Kentucky. Uh, ran into a, a bit of an issue there, so we're not quite done with that. And we've got another project uh, that they they might be starting today on Finney Terrace west of, uh, west of Princeton. Uh, we've also been doing some patching uh, up around Le Loop in the Wellsville area. And then uh, we added some riprap to the, to the big drainage ditch on the east side of uh, Montana, just north of Kingman, there's a lot of erosion through there uh, uh, with the flooding, and so we worked with the adjoining farmer to uh, uh, take care of those erosion spots and, and shore that ditch up. Uh, Panhandle Eastern Pipeline Company has got a big maintenance project that they're going to be working on um, on Douglas Road, just west of Indiana. As a part of that project, they're going they're going to be working in the ditches but they want to close the road for that mile um, um, between, where is it, uh, uh, Indiana and Idaho. Uh, they want to close that road so they have plenty of uh, area to work and they're not disturbed by traffic. Uh, so they're going to detour folks north um, along Indiana and back down Idaho, up to Ellis and back down Idaho to get around that site. The work will start on Friday, and they should be wrapped up by uh, Tuesday is the, is the plan right now. And so uh, they've got some signage out so folks are aware that things are going to be happening, and then they will uh, close the road. I'll work with Casey to, um, to get the word out on social media and whatnot as well. Uh, so that's, that's all I have at this point. Got it. We're going to be working this week, the rest of this week, to get the sample ballots out so everyone can see their ballot for the upcoming primary election. And um, just I'm working on getting all of our primary ballot applications input, and we've had a really great response to that mailing that we sent out. Obviously, the, the virus is a, is a concern in our community, and, and we have had people that say they they don't want to do that and they don't have to do that but we have had a lot of people who have responded to that and are going to be getting a primary ballot in the mail so yeah. 
again, if you have any questions about that, just direct people to me. My office. Early voting start in your office? Um, voting will start on July 20th in the courthouse. So we're working to get things set up for that um, with some hand sanitization stations and stuff at the door so as people come in. Um, and hopefully we uh, don't have to restrict the flow of traffic or anything. Uh, you know, generally the primary election's not too overwhelming, so hopefully we'll, uh, it'll work out. Commissioner's comments, board reports, Don? Uh, I've got it. Where, have you heard anything back from Cook, Cook Flat and Strobel and Virginia, the ditching? Outside the bridge, you know. Oh, uh, north of Lane? Yeah. No, sir, we have not yet. Okay. Uh, the only thing, I did get a, ta a email from uh, Wellsville this morning, city, and if anybody's going to their city meeting tonight, required. you got to have a mask on. And if you don't have one, it says the city will provide one. But evidently, they're taking it serious. I mean, with the last bit of uh, happening up in that area. So I did get an email from them uh, that I haven't attended any meetings or anything last week. Rick? I haven't been to any meetings. Uh, got an email from Paul the other day. He's been having trouble making contact. The sawmill we talked about at Williamsburg finally made contact with the owner and they put it on hold till the COVID-19 lets up so nothing's happening out there on that and I haven't been to any other meetings all right I am I attended the Black Lives Matter rally on Friday evening um, I, I know people will say well why were you there well because they have every right to be heard like any other Franklin County citizen um, I, I was really excited that it was actually put together by a couple of young people. Um, young people are going to be the future of our county, and it was great to see them in leadership. Um, there was a young gal not too far from me had a sign, and this is not exactly, but pretty much it said, it's too bad when leaders act like children, or children act like leaders and leaders act like children. And I went over and touched her on the, on the shoulder and went, not all leaders act like children. And she said, well, most of them do. And I said, well, I'm a county commissioner and I'm here. And she was like, oh, wow, you know, thanks for being here. And there were a lot of leaders that I saw, a lot of them. I mean, we had masks on and that was great. I mean, most of the crowd did have masks on, but you know, the sheriff was there, uh, police chief was there, the county attorney was there, mayor of Ottawa, uh, head of the Ch uh, Ottawa chamber, um, FCDC director, those are the ones I saw. You know, there were a lot of leaders there and it was great, great to see there. One of the signs that I saw pretty much exactly was how I felt, which said, I understand that I will never understand, but I will stand. You know, I will never understand what it's like to be a non-white person in, the, in Franklin County or to have children that are going to school. Um, but I, I, will, I can stand and I can listen and I can understand that, you know, we, we've come a long way, but we are not where we probably should be. Um, if you think that race discrimination is not happening in Franklin County, let me let you talk to a mother of non-white children who has kids that are going to our schools and the horror stories that her kids have to, to tell because of things that happen to them only because of the color of their skin. Um, you know, it, it, does, it does happen in Franklin County. But at the same time, I am very proud of the law enforcement that we have in Franklin County, the leadership that we have, um, both so the sheriff and Chief Weingartner have expressed the, the fact that the things that you hear about on the nightly news, we are not going, are not going to be allowed in Franklin County. Um, that is, we have a great group of law enforcement men and women who have sworn to um, serve and protect all of the citizens of Franklin County, no matter the color of their skin. And I appreciate them very much and they deserve our respect. And that is it. Thank you. Roy? I went to the Area Agency on Aging meeting yesterday morning. Um, they are planning on building a, a 60, by, 60 by 75 uh, garage building out there for their vans. Uh, um, we discussed what kind of building they actually want, and I think we're going with an all-metal building. And 
four to five inches of concrete floor and uh, probably have to do some landscaping and stuff like that outside there uh, they have a little over six acres of property out there in the north industrial park so we talked about the garage and specifications on that uh, uh, they're going to get another walk-in freezer. A lot of their uh, commodities are coming in, in uh, bulk, bigger bulk supplies, and uh, they need another walk-in freezer, so they're going to get one of those. And they need a couple of cooks and a couple of drivers. Uh, uh, one's down in the southeast area, and the other's down in, like, uh, the Coffee County area. Uh, drivers for going to the uh, uh, meal sites and also delivering meals on the wheels at the same time. Um, and then they're talking about their 2021 budget too, so that's about it for um, that meeting. Um, Coffee County Commissioner was there and they said they're wide open, no restrictions in Coffee County. I've attended a few meetings since last we met. The FCDC, we've had some Zoom meetings uh, interviewing folks for uh, marketing the industrial park and the county as a whole, and the uh, finance committee for uh, Elizabeth Layton Center. But um, both of those agencies do a good job of reporting back to us, so I don't have anything above and beyond to really tell you about that. We have a study session scheduled for Monday. You. Uh, do we have business? Do we need that? Uh, I don't know at this juncture. A little uh, early, so I just thought. Yeah, I'll reach out to you. Um, I mean, to talk to my communications director. I know we've we've talked about branding. That could be an opportunity to have that discussion if we're ready. So, I, as I sit here, I feel like yeah, we probably will have business sure. on Monday. Um, but I'll be in touch on that. All right, sounds good. Anyone else? Anything else before we look to adjourn? All right. We look for a motion to adjourn. Would somebody like to do that? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>